Welcome everyone to our first uh, webinar in a meeting series called Innovative E-commerce with Divante. And I'm, I'm Agnieszka and I'm marketing product owner at Divante. And uh, today I will make sure together with Agata that everything's going well during our meeting. Uh, before we get to the agenda, meet our today guests, speakers, Artur, uh, Zelimir, and uh, Alex. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. Hey Hello. We start from the Artur uh, speech about uh, innovations, latest technologies, and uh, clear process at Innovation Lab. The second speaker is uh, Alex Uhto, an e-commerce consultant at Divante. He works in e-commerce practice and he will talk about a composable commerce approach and composable commerce technologies. And last but not least is uh, Zelimir Gusak, also e-commerce consultant at Divante, but he works in progressive uh, in PWA practice and he will tell you about progressive web apps and benefits for end users, developers and <coughs> business. And uh, finally, we have a Q&A session with our speakers. You can ask during this webinar your questions on the chat on the right. And uh, I'm switching right now to the Q&A mode so you can ask your questions in Q&A mode and we will answer them at the end of this webinar. And I would like to hand over to Arthur. Arthur, you can you can start. Um, and I hope that you will enjoy this this meeting with us. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Thanks thanks for joining. Um, you know the, the goal of today is that um, we want to give you a better understanding of how you can start your innovation approach within your company, um, especially in the corporate, and specifically how a product discovery can help you with that. So um, I will try to cover several questions, such as how to translate your KPIs into digital opportunities, um, how to test potential solutions with users, and how to map them to, to the future-proof solutions. So um, the agenda uh, of my part is as follows. Uh, first, I'll tell you a bit about the current trends which are visible in tech and, and commerce. Uh, then I will talk a bit more about why we actually need innovation and how we can use uh, business KPIs to transform them into something concrete. <clears throat> After that, there's going to be some uh, deep dive into the process of uh, product discovery. I think that's the most interesting part of the presentation. Um, and after that, I will leave you with some must reads uh, in the end. So let's go. Um, but first, um, uh, to tell you a bit about the background, because maybe not all of you are familiar, um, we're lucky to be a part of the one of biggest commerce uh, tech companies in the region with HQ in, in Poland. And, uh, you know, from very beginning in our DNA, we have a drive to see always what is next. <clears throat> we are by nature uh, very innovation driven. And while working with um, a lot of industry leaders, we have a chance to spot what are the missing pieces in the digital landscape. And we were able to address them with repeatable products. For example, uh, one of the spin-offs the storefronts just secured 17 million in Serie A after being, you know, incubated in by Y Combinator. Um, it it started when we've seen that front-end technologies are too slow and too attached to the back-end. Uh, the same as with uh, open loyalty, which which started when we saw gaps with the within the loyalty engines. So. Um, uh, in order to um, to start, uh, we need to understand the lights that the landscape we're in. So, uh, no matter which client we're talking to, we always start with a few elements to stimulate the discussion. And because of the diversity of the industries and guests, and uh, because of the limited time, uh, I'll just give you an example of each without a deep dive. So, um, let's talk shortly about general tech trends, which are easy to find due to institution like, you know, Gartner or Forrester, uh, because by that we want to show customer what investment other decision makers are doing, which technologies are worth considering, uh, long term, short term, and what should they adopt uh, in the in the nearest future. Um, in this context, the is the idea of combinational innovation, which means, according to Gartner, uh, the practice of using components of different digital technologies and trends 
uh, together to uncover new or better value. And right now, uh, this combinational innovation is possible by addressing and combining three main uh, silos. These are people centricity, resilient delivery, and location independence. So um, people centricity is uh, focused on reacting on behaviors, making sure we're in the place where the user needs us, but also taking the privacy into consideration. Um, location independence is uh, enabling this high availability and performance from everywhere, especially by distributed clouds, and you know it generates a new 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 business value. Um, and this um, resilient delivery is a very interesting concept of uh, of an end game called hyper automation, which is the approach to uh, rapidly identify, uh, validate, and automate as many businesses and IT processes as possible. So after, after showing uh, what is possible in the, you know, in, in, in the market and in the industry and in general tech, we're jumping to our core, uh, which is e-commerce. And it is really helpful to understand core tech direction and translate them later on into what's possible in the digital sales. Uh, for example, each year we're doing the report to point out uh, what are the next big movers like marketplaces right now, right? Um, to, um, to make sure that, uh, that we don't miss anything crucial while navigating into the future. So um, afterwards, it's you know, worth discussing uh, how those trends facilitate to digital strategies. So at this point, uh, it's worth talking about how clients can um, react towards market changes, which were even, you know, more rapidly uh, the last one year and a half due to the pandemic. So it can be done by keeping or creating a module architecture, stepping away uh, from an inflexible and slow monolithic structure, uh, which Alex is going to talk in the, in the next part. So um, let's, let's go further, I believe. Um, jumping to the process, just, just one remark. Um, it is a tough lesson, tough lesson that um, innovation in order to stick needs to be well thought. It cannot be gimmick uh, or a simple add-on to how the business operates now. So, 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 so one of the base which we're using is the 10 types of innovation. It was created by, by a company acquired by Deloitte. And it explores those insights to diagnose patterns of innovation uh, within the industries to identify those opportunities, um, evaluate uh, how firms are performing against competitors and so on. So uh, we take a look at configuration, offering and experience in the same time to create something that sticks. Um, okay, so um, uh, one cliche, uh, but you know, without understanding um, our market blueprint, it will be really hard to process in reality. So. Um, we started thinking um, how to utilize uh, those, what I said in the beginning about Devante internal drive for, for what's, what's next, um, how to utilize it for uh, to our internal talents, how to spot uh, more potential improvements and help our customers meet uh, KPIs. So um, we founded the innovation lab on something bay called uh, Jobs to be Done. And you may probably know it, uh, this format, which is on the slide from uh, Value Proposition Canvas. Um, so we started asking on those jobs what they want apart from increasing revenue, right? Um, we, we, we spotted that they want to digitalize products and services. Uh, they, um, they have many projects at the same time. Uh, they would like to streamline uh, processes and increase the customer satisfaction. Um, but uh, on the other hand, with the internal resources, it's hard for them to have a, a lot of time and a lot of attention. And it's really hard to be on top of the game when there is a limited budget uh, for innovation and limited access for the newest digital knowledge because uh, it's not your focus, then, then, then you're not on the top of the game, right? So uh, we wanted to save their time, uh, give the best breed knowledge, um, support this uh, internal buy-in, right? Uh, for the ideas which um, which people in the corporate um, have in their mind. So I won't go through all the artifacts here, but um, to to make it clear what are the deliverables we, we've seen are really valuable for, for the customers is the um, executive summary deck on the end of the sprint with a clear USP. 
uh, is a tested prototype, um, industry report uh, with trends, with desk research, and uh, working and fully functioning proof of concept. Uh, so uh, after that introduction, let's jump into the core of today's talk. So basically, what is, what is a product discovery? Um, because it is a crucial concept here. Um, Product discovery describes the iterative process of reducing uncertainty uh, around the problem or an idea uh, to make sure that the right product gets built for the right right, uh, right people, for the right audience, right? Um, so product discovery offers uh, our teams uh, uh, with a higher confidence in, in, in their path forward uh, before, before starting building stuff. Um, and to represent uh, briefly how we understand it, there is one quote by Teresa Torres, uh, who is leader in, 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 in continuous discovery. And she said that uh, it is all about answering the question, uh, what should I now build in my solution? And to reach answer to these questions, we do both exploring and validating what we have found. So. Um, you know, this is um, this this these activities are always taken from three different perspectives. It's always business, user, and tech. So uh, we know that the digital product is never done, and uh, we lead the discovery services of uh, different kinds at various stages of the growth. So it's uh, you know it, it has to be continuous process. It's it's not something which happens just at the beginning of the process. Um, and let me show you how it may work. Um, first of all, um, it's uh, it's really important to have something which is called uh, product trio. So you have all the three perspectives which which I mentioned and support this with with some with some uh, external expertise. Uh, so especially from the from, from the client side. So um, we tried to follow the uh, opportunity solution tree from from the book Continuous Discovery, which I which I mentioned, but. It was too overwhelming uh, with the pace of the R&D work, and we adapted it to our clusters where um, every single thought has an implication in insights. Because um, in, in you know in this cognitive process, it's really important to make sure that all of the ideas have consequences, and you know why you choose them or why you uh, deleted them from from your mind or from from your idea. Uh, and the the whole process is divided into the three main phases. Um, first of them, first of them is the project preparation. Second is the core one month cycle uh, within the whole team engaged. And the third part is preparing the the project for the delivery uh, to being handled. Uh, you know, either either as a um, as a pitch deck or as a as a continuous uh, development. But this is the handover, uh, so so we don't lose a track because it's really easy to uh, create an idea in the POC, but then lose it in translation, and uh, we failed here a few times. So uh, uh, yeah, it's it's not so good. Um, Okay, so during the um, the first stage, the the project preparation, together with the partners, uh, we crystallize what we uh, want to be focused on during the next steps. So synergy definition is you know about understanding the high level strategy of our partners and shaping is um, forming the uh, the problem which needs to be solved and understanding the value which we need to provide. So. Um, we need we need to all the time to find a synergy uh, about the, the trends and and the uh, the actual the actual goals of the of the clients, and because we are able to clash those perspectives together, um, we know what is the prioritized uh, part and and what, what should we focus on, and this is how we find an ideal uh, and maybe not ideal but initial at least uh, direction. Um, then there is uh, the environmental research um, from as, as a first stage of the of the cycle. So um, we try to um, go as broad as possible with the research uh, to um, cover mainly, you know, um, it, it is like a desk research, but depending on the case, specific actions may be taken individually. So 
uh, it is mainly represented by benchmarking, competitors analysis, and all given data by clients, all internal materials, which we can have, uh, as well as the access to the analytics tools, Hotjar, and so on. Um, and to uh, this is this is a you know T-shaped uh, research research because this one is uh, is horizontally, and then we go um, into the scoped research, which is uh, narrowed down. And the scoped research is all about uh, diving deeper into the mapped triggers, which we have found in the environmental research. Um, so now we have those corridors, which we already mapped, and we go further. Um, we, as, as, as mentioned a few slides before, we formulate those insights. So, for example, from a user perspective, when we find in some report that B2B buyers are acting in a specific way, uh, we organize interviews where we can ask those B2B buyers about those behaviors, right? And um, from a tech point of view, after discovering some tools during the environmental research, we check their demo deeply to understand and evaluate them, whether they're good or not for, for the problem given. And after those two research stages, uh, together with, with partner, right, we decide uh, which research takeaways are the most important to be covered within our final solution. And then we're ready for the next step, which is uh, defining. So <clears throat> defining is about having a <clears throat> closer look at all those triggers and insights generated. Um, and we transfer them into the design challenges to set you know, consistent directions for the whole team. And while we formulate those challenges, many ideas come to members' mind. And uh, this is the process. This is the part of the process where the number of insights start to grow rapidly. And uh, we map them in the common workspace, of, of course, uh, because it simplifies the uh, ideation in the future. Uh, so when it's all defined, uh, we jump into the something which already somebody can see because this, this, those first three steps are rather you know blurry and the concrete step happens on the stage of developing um, so um, here um, you know of course uh, we, we act agile and we're designing the ideas testing them as fast as frequent as possible and those are considered as a part of the solution and this is uh, something that, uh, you know, um, after, after this, this happens simultaneously, tech and, and business, because we're doing the POC uh, that our tech lead delivers at the end of the project cycle. Um, and after the, this is, this is nothing else like a really short scrum process when you have everything defined already, right? Uh, but it happens in like one or two weeks. And uh, at the very end, uh, we, because as I said at the beginning, we're trying to support um, stakeholders to, to have a buy-in for this idea or uh, to, to convince somebody that this is a good idea, to, a good direction to go. Uh, we also, with, with the support of, of the marketing team, um, help to polish and build a story uh, which can be told. So this is the place uh, where we are setting the next steps we propose to our partners and uh, we consulted with this partner representative to make sure that in the end it meets the, the KPIs given at the, at the very beginning. Um, and yeah, so uh, when it comes to the, um, the, the presentation handover and the consulting part, uh, we share the process takeaways, the final solution prototypes, the POC, the next steps. And uh, we're you know, cross-checking whether we have answered the, the research questions given at the beginning. So um, member of the final meetings are almost always the same as in the case of the kickoff. So um, thanks to, you know, engaging this, uh, this delivery team throughout the, all the process, uh, from, from uh, you know, uh, we are ready for the smooth trans uh, takeover. And here, after having a, a buy-in from, from, from a client, we're ready to uh, start quickly with the, um, with the implementation. So um, this is uh, how it looks like in a nutshell. And in case of you know, diving deeper into any part of this process, I'm open for the Q&A. Um, but uh, before handling it to, to Alex, um, I just want to leave you with some knowledge base where you can uh, where you can read more about what inspired us to, to build such a process. 
Um, so it's like a shape up by base camp um, inside a tornado uh, to, to understand how to spot what is next. Uh, mentioned previously Tiras Autores about the continuous discovery, which is especially helpful, uh, helpful not in service, but in also the is designed for the product teams, not for the services team. And the same with Marty Kagan books, Inspired and the, and Empowered. Um, and th those are the links. So uh, I will share those with you in an in a email summary for uh, some nice readings uh, where you can where you can um, read further. Um, okay, so um, the summary, um, you know, um, the summary is that. Um, we, it's, it's obvious, but the digital world is changing really fast, right? And uh, the, the innovation in companies is more important than ever. Um, next, next point to take from this presentation is that, um, throughout the process of product discovery, you can translate your KPIs into the actionable insights and actionable, uh, prototypes, which can be implemented. Um, then uh, third point is that uh, discovery should always start from research and goal definition uh, because it's <clears throat> it's really often that we see uh, people wanting to jump into the solution without properly defining uh, what is what is the definition of a success. So lessons from uh, product companies should be taken into consideration here. Um, and uh, please make sure while thinking about, you know, uh, creating some innovation that uh, you need to be ready to, to translate it smoothly uh, because this is a, a really tough bottleneck. Um, okay, that's uh, it from my side. This is the, the team and um, Alex, I'll give it to you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Uh, I'm Alex. I've been working for last seven years at Devanta. Uh, I've been focused on e-commerce since the very, very beginning. So I am, went through elements that will appear today, like old fashioned and new fashion approach. Uh, today, I would like to tell more how uh, e-commerce has changed uh, during last years, especially, uh, I mean, five years, of course, last two, two years was a, was a crazy, crazy uh, time. However, uh, I would like to take a look at the e-commerce from architecture perspective. Uh, I know some of you probably are focused on business only, but it's worth to, to know how, how the architecture uh, is, is evolving and how to think about e-commerce uh, right now. Uh, it's kind of funny because when I started working for Devanta and uh, we were discussing like seven, five, four years ago, everybody was talking about e-commerce engine. Uh, as you can see in our position, we have more like e-commerce ecosystem. And this is like the expression that we are using more and more uh, across to all communication. I mean, we as a e-commerce related community and e-commerce engine is even more related uh, with, uh, with this word uh, than it used to be from my perspective. Because if you will take a look at the engine, this is like a lot of different elements that are combined together and are working uh, to make sure uh, that everything is going towards a good direction. So, but if you will take out just one, even the smallest plugin from the engine, the whole engine will stop running. Uh, and a slightly different situation is with the ecosystem. Because if you will take a look at the ecosystem, uh, ecosystem is built, of course, similarly with different elements. But if you will take out uh, some, some, some small piece from the ecosystem, the whole ecosystem will be still uh, there for a while uh, before it will change. But at the end of the day, it will address its own element. So I would uh, uh, um, I compare it with the e-commerce engine would be a, a monolithic approach. You have one solution that is uh, addressing as much elements as it possible and ecosystem which is more like composable commerce that is combined from different small pieces that are working together but at the end of the day are uh, not so uh, dependent uh, if you will take a look at the monolithic architecture you will find here everything the great examples are uh, the platforms like magento spriker and similar sap of course you have 
all in one solutions uh, from from one system you can manage almost everything that is related to to e-commerce uh, products in some range uh, orders uh, even customers information promotion uh, and all the things you can you can imagine so that was the old way and uh, that was the general idea of the system producers to address as many functionalities as many elements as possible to make sure that you just buy in it and you can cover everything uh, that could happen right now or even in a near future or distant uh, a future. Totally different approach what we have right now and we, what we've been observing, especially over the last three years, uh, even that uh, uh, the, the solutions that, that I'm presenting that are part of composable commerce are uh, more mature, of course. Uh, yeah, so, so composable commerce is some kind of an ecosystem. You are taking best of breed architecture. You are taking the, the best elements uh, from the stack. For example, you, you are focusing on e-commerce and e-commerce is focused only on, on, on operations related to orders uh, and nothing else. So uh, if you will uh, make a choice, you are focused on very specific elements. The same story with CMS, checkouts, of course, that happened in a, in a, in a previous, let's say, uh, approach, but with uh, composable commerce, you can choose even the smallest elements, of course, order management, search, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What it gives, um, and one most important, I think, part that was uh, pretty problematic with the, uh, with the uh, monolithic approach is uh, front end. Front end, uh, there is a lot of information that is headless front end. Uh, I've heard a lot of times that if front end assumed uh, to be a hat, it couldn't be headless. So a lot of people and producers is calling is bodyless front end. So let's assume this bodyless front end. Uh, bodyless front end, which is somehow independent from other elements, of course, supporting them uh, is way more easier uh, to implement new, new changes. Uh, and you could be focused on user experience, do not looking uh, through your arm and, and, and thinking how the backend will behave, how, how the all elements that are related uh, will limit me or, or maybe not. <clears throat> so composable commerce allows you to make a cherry pick from all of, the, all of those elements uh, and making sure that uh, this very specific piece of your business could be addressed in the best possible way. Um, at the first glance, it should be like reasonable, but there is a more uh, and more uh, uh, reasons why the hell monolithic approach uh, is so problematic. Uh, maybe some of you already experienced that, uh, maybe not. So I just would like to point some of, 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 of you, maybe you are in the middle of decision process. Uh, so uh, monolithic architecture, so having everything in one, one place is always related with single point of failure which means like this, this comparison with the, with the engine. If something will be broke in just one small aspect, it can be affect the whole system, which is pretty problematic because from the business perspective, the business continuity for e-commerce is a king because that's obvious. When, when e-commerce is not working, is not making money, so that's the last thing that product owners would like to have. Uh, performance, performance issues. Uh, probably a lot of you have heard that uh, from, from other product owners or other people that are related to e-commerce. Yeah, the performance is poor. I have to improve that. That's endless story, of course. Always could be better. But with monolithical approach, uh, it's especially problematic because every milliseconds costs you a lot of efforts. And at the end of the day, it's... it's it's hard to, to, to manage and uh, uh, appropriate uh, results uh, at the end. It's because of the approach, it's because of the architecture, and it's because of the, the general uh, logic of the solution. Uh, of course, uh, maintenance is not so easy uh, because, first of all, uh, when you are adding more and more things uh, within the one solution, you are making more and more relations. So uh, when the technical depth, which is 
uh, addressing the, the elements related to those dependencies uh, is growing. Uh, the, the bigger time to market of new features is happening. So, uh, of course, if you would like to be compatible, uh, competitive, if you would like to be innovative, you need to have lightning fast uh, a, a process from decision, from idea uh, to, to, to feature implementation to verify if it works, if it's attractive for your clients or not. So having, having this monolithic architecture, it's becoming more and more challenging. Uh, if something takes more time, it costs more. So that's pretty obvious relations. Uh, and upgrades. Uh, if you are building something, you are building more and more relations uh, within the system. Of course, uh, any upgrades or any changes uh, becoming more problematic. So upgrades, uh, if you heard about anyone who had Magento, 2.0 and then try to go to Magento 2.1 and from Magento 2.1 to Magento 2.2, eh, you probably will not hear some, some nice words. Uh, that was the challenge that needed to be solved because it was harmful for, for the business. And at the end of the day, we know what's the, the, the biggest challenge right now in IT, it's resources. Uh, people are working somewhere for three, five, six months and going further. So we have to be prepared how to onboard people to make them as effective as possible. Of course, it would be great to keep them forever, but uh, we have to be prepared for onboarding. With monolithic architecture, especially that's been uh, developed for five, seven years, there's so many dependencies that are not so obvious uh, that uh, any onboarding and making successful uh, uh, workers will take way longer than it's supposed to be. So uh, more general elements that are related with monolithic architecture, systems try to be addressed as many elements as possible, which is, of course, especially for specific business model, not so, not so beneficial. Uh, and it comes with uh, less advanced functionalities in a given area. So that was quite, quite problematic. And of course, I mentioned already about it, but uh, heavy dependency of design improvements and design elements from, from the backend uh, operations. How Composable Commerce is addressing that? Uh, just simply, I hope uh, there will be a lot of questions at the end, but I would like to just highlight a few of the most important ones. Uh, more predictable uh, maintenance, that's for sure, uh, because elements that are composed uh, the whole ecosystem are more SaaS solutions and has uh, still options of, of extension thanks to microservices. Uh, solutions are focused on niches. You have uh, five, four, uh, seven different uh, searches. One search is more for customization. Second search is more for retail, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You have those freedom of choice. And the general idea is to make all those elements more configurable and more out of the box. Um, you don't have a situation thanks to those distribution that one bug will influence the whole system because the one bug is just in the one area and this one area will not harm the rest. Of course, it doesn't work. Uh, uh, the, the, the rest of the system will not be fully functional, but still will not disappear. That's a great advantage of this. Uh, performance with uh, composable commerce and this uh, more, let's say, uh, uh, distributed approach will be better to achieve. Uh, sorry, that's my daughter. She's she's uh, uh, handling with bricks, which is uh, actually quite related to the topic we have because composable commerce is more like building from bricks that in general fits together. But at the end of the day, you could build whatever you want. Uh, clear division of responsibilities. If you have team, uh, you can... Uh, attach the team that is focused on uh, few functionalities or few group of functionalities of group of or, or systems. You don't have to have one man army that could manage everything because everything is somehow related to any other uh, element. So that makes work under the whole system more uh, and more um, uh, effective. Uh, another element is versionless approach. This is my new favorite, I hope still not the buzzword, 
because actually it's not. And versionless means that you don't have version of systems. If it's SaaS and the core uh, has uh, uh, just guarantee SLA and all you have to do is ju just buy subscription and you are building around that, there, there will be no new versions. And anything you will build around it, you will, don't, you will not have to uh, upgrade, which is uh, a great dream of every, every person who had the chance to, to experience upgrade uh, especially for, for for maybe without names, but uh, I've I've heard about a lot of systems that that, that had problems uh, with the uh, upgrades, um, and it was influencing uh, the business continuity uh, a lot. So that's just in a nutshell. Uh, I'm care, uh, counting on a lot of uh, questions at, at at the end, especially that's just our first meeting. So uh, I hope I will have a chance to tell you more about it. Uh, bodyless frontend is not directly connected with PWA. It doesn't have to be uh, like equally like bodyless frontend is PWA. Doesn't have to be. However, it's very much related topic, and I would be more than happy to uh, invite Z to tell more about PWA. Thank you. Hey, hi guys. Uh, thank you, Alex, for handing it over to me. So uh, my name is uh, Zelimir, uh, shorter Z. Uh, for almost two years now, I've been working as a business consultant in PWA practice here at Devante. Uh, today, I would like to tell you a little bit about benefits that Progressive Web App bring to different groups. So I'm talking about end users, I'm talking about developers, and finally, I'm talking about businesses itself. Go forward. Okay, so here is the agenda very quickly. The first slide is particularly interesting and it says home of PWA. I know it's a bold statement, but I'll do my best to offer a detail or two that should uh, hopefully justify this claim. But first, allow me to present my department, which is a PWA practice at Devante. So, okay. Uh, PW practice is one of four practices that we have here at Devante. Uh, we have right now around 50 developers and we are growing strong. Uh, I'm glad to say that the great majority of the people that we have on board are actually production staff. Uh, in addition to devs, we have support staff ranging from PMs, PMOs, uh, all the way to QAs. Uh, in the different stages of development and also maintenance and support, we currently have 13 projects mostly big projects that have been ongoing for a year or more right now. So let's dig in a little bit further. So uh, this is where we come to the part that should sh shed some light as to why we consider ourselves a home of PWA. Devanta has been on the forefront of PWA for quite some time right now, actually uh, long before it became profitable. We have created some of the most popular PWA solutions on the market. Uh, the experience we have is coming from the fact that we have built, well, well, actually some of the most used solutions on the market. I'm sure that a lot of you have heard about uh, View Storefront. It's a bodiless front end that follows composable commerce trends. And uh, I mean, I, I'll just share one fact that is actually portrayed the success of this solution. All the other PWA solutions on the market today have less than 50% of live implementations that VSF has. So. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Going further, uh, we are talking about one more solution that we have built. Uh, together with Shopper Engineers, we created a PWA storefront for their new platform, Shopper 6. It's been out, I think, for a year and a half now, or a year, something like that. Uh, users of Shopper can opt to use this solution of, of ours and kind of yield the best of this advanced technology. So this is a native-like solution that is actually a part of the platform right now. To these days, our engineers are continuing cooperation with Shopper on these solutions, and we're going strong. And this is also something that is very, very uh, uh, well known throughout the world. Uh, we're talking about Spartacus. This is a solution that SAP uh, ecosystem was actually looking for. Uh, uh, we started working uh, with SAP on this in 2017. We created a, a product together with their engineers, and uh, uh, Today, still, we are uh, continuously developing it with SAP. Uh, it's basically um, an open source, headless uh, front-end product uh, that was built using modern G uh, JS frameworks. Uh, it's 
fully upgradable, it's fully extendable, it's uh, fully customizable. And actually, it is a preferred solution that, that is actually right now effectively replacing an old solution um, called Accelerator. Uh, so I, with all this said, it's clear we are all about PWAs, and, but what really is a PWA? So just to do a step back, I'm pretty sure that almost everybody here knows what it is, but just quickly, uh, P PWAs are actually far from novelty. And uh, as they've been around for quite some time now, the term itself has been coined, I believe, in 2015 or something like that. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, it has been quite uh, quite earlier it has been started by, by, by Apple, actually, the whole this approach. However, they obviously switched to um, App Store model. It made more sense for them, obviously. PWA is actually a cross-platform solution that can single-handedly replace solutions that you might have for a few channels. So like uh, iOS app, Android app, uh, a mobile site you might have. So PWA is basically offers one code base uh, to, to rule them all. Uh, just think of development, maintenance, marketing cost that you might have for each of the channel. So it's basically everything in one solution. Uh, I like to say like it's a solution that offers like uh, the, the, the interesting paradigm, uh, paradigm uh, any operating system, any screen, anywhere. So that's basically what PWAs are. I, I, I mean, the benefits and the gains that PWAs have are really wide, but let's dig a little bit deeper and kind of try to offer them uh, and, and, and present them uh, from the aspect of different user groups. So first of all, we will be talking about the, 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 the user group that is actually, well, the, 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 the most important for all of us. We're talking about end users. And we're gonna talk about end user benefits that we have over there. So uh, I, I, I think it's absolutely clear, clear how, how crucial site speeds are, uh, site speed is. And for every user, it's absolutely important. But for online businesses, it's 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 regardless of its if if it is a store or if it's a new site, it, it site speed is absolutely important. Online primarily mobile users are even more impatient. So actually, I I believe half of the mobile visits are abandoned if the loading of the web page takes more than three seconds. So it's pretty clear that speed is super important factor here if we want to keep our users satisfied, and that's what we are trying to achieve. Going further. We are talking about uh, reliability. Reliability of progressive web apps actually um, are, are, are based on the fact that they are able to work even without an internet connection. That actually means a stable and consistent experience for your users, regardless of the connection quality. Um, how should I put it? it? It allows users to stay engaged as long as they want. They, they have a, a, a a continuous, uh, they have an, an opportunity to continuously browse the product catalog or even add items to a cart without an internet, con internet connection. There is a little bit of disclaimer here. This does not happen out of the box. It needs to be built. And it actually has a lot to do with the strategy that goes together with it. And when I'm saying strategy, it's, it's a strategy around the offline capabilities. So like, what kind of a content you want to make available while offline and it's like what you want to cache like you cannot put actually everything over there so it's a crucial aspect here and it's need to be meticulously assessed even prior the app built actually going further we are talking about engagement and a uh, pwas actually has an access to device features and it makes it able to enrich the experience that the user has and it actually uh, avoids problems with re-engagement so PV, uh, PWAs are conveniently accessible and uh, directly from the browser. You can save them on the screen. And actually, uh, this, kind of an, uh, this kind of an approach uh, works very well for brands as they can send their consumers push notifications with special real-time offers, updates, uh, uh, cart abandonment reminders, and so on. So in return, that should actually increase customers' loyalty quite a bit. Going further, we are talking about uh, 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 app-like features and uh, uh, some of the features that are coming from the world of mobile apps that can be found in, in, in PWAs are push notifications, uh, full screen appearance, or should I say app-like interface. And they all together, PWAs actually have a look and feel of a mobile app, but without some limitations. So for instance, in the last few years, all the researches are confirming that users are actually pretty reluctant to download new apps. So avoiding app generators is one of the things that is absolutely important because uh, PWAs do not work in the same manner as uh, uh, mobile apps have when we are talking about distribution. 
So they are served via the web browser. There is no need to go to the app store. So a typical process that, that should be kind of uh, uh, think of an app that you might need, visit the app store, find an app, download it. It's somewhat tiresome and lengthy and especially with modern users. And when we take into consideration that the app is usually downloaded and then a lot of them are never used. So this makes even, even more sense. Okay, so uh, always up to date. What does that mean? Well, compared to mobile apps, there is no need to update a PWA in a typical fashion. So you do not get an update, update notification that you need to update it in a store. Uh, they're always up to date, uh, offering latest version of uh, on demand. There is actually no version; it's versionless, but it's over there, right when you need it. Yes, there is a need to kind of refresh the assets that you have stored on the device that are maybe cached over there. But if there was any change on the content store uh, stored over there, yes, there it needs to happen. But that's about it. That that's all the refreshment that you might need. So uh, digital users don't really like to be forced. Uh, to do anything that they don't want to do. They, they, they don't want to have any kind of obstacles in their path. They want to go through the funnel very quickly. And they rather give up than spend some extra seconds to, for the page to full, fully load. So with their smartphones, with, poor, with, with some of them with poor network conditions that they have, with, with expensive data plans, they, they are the most uh, impatient ones. But I mean, let's face it, the, the, their number is growing, especially in emerging and promising markets such as Asia and Africa. So. We have to meet their expectations, so that's pretty pretty simple. Now we are switching to what benefits do actually uh, do do developers have when working with uh, with a PWAs. Uh, this is the trickiest part because it's kind of you know like something that is that is objective for somebody is subjective for somebody else. But this is actually coming from the discussion that we've had with with our clients, with our developers. So let me talk just a little bit about this. So when talking about uh, new and modern technologies, this is exactly what PWAs offer. Uh, compared to old ways, like with typical platform solutions and so on, PWAs are using some modern concept and technologies. So we are talking about uh, uh, technologies such as modern JS frameworks, but also commonly used HTML, uh, CSS, and so on. All these details are making PWA projects interesting for developers. And let's be honest, who doesn't want to work with proper tools, with good quality tools, modern ones? Fast build and release cycles. Ah, this is very, very interesting and very important, not just for developers. When talking about these cycles, this actually refers to refers to a separation of work when it comes to the front end versus back end. So the team working on PWA or let's say headless project that does not have to worry about the other team's build release cycles because they're totally independent of them. Every team can follow their own pace of development and such and in the same aspect build release cycles. Uh, furthermore, uh, it's it's one of those solutions, uh, one of those situations where you can have like almost a release whenever you want to have it. But because why? <laughs> You're totally independent from development of the other teams. Going further, a use of microservice architecture. This is in, in some aspect connected with what Alec uh, uh, was talking about. Uh, one of the things that PWAs kind of enforce us or actually enforce devs is to use a bit of that microservice approach. Basically, um, uh, PWAs kind of force us to split an app into smaller chunks. So, for instance, you divide uh, 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 you divide them in, in in logical blocks. So you can have in one block authentication and authorization system uh, as a separate microservice. Then you have CMS as another microservice, and so on. So that should give us a better control and security and overall flexibility. Okay, so. Uh, I would like, uh, uh, when it comes to integrations, I would like to, 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 to address this because this is, again, very important. And again, coming from the fact that we are separated from the backend part. PWA uh, uh, being a presentation layer uh, are actually giving developers an opportunity to concentrate, well, simply just on that. They do not have to worry about integration per se. Uh, the reason being integrations are handled by a set of APIs, which simply connects to interface on the other side. Uh, being a backend or actually any other third-party system for that matter. So actually, uh, I always like to mention this part quite a bit and they, uh, because developers are immensely important uh, for all of us, actually. Without them, I'd be just a sales guy talking about things he cannot make. And uh, it's I, generally speaking and speaking about the workforce, it's not just the developers. The current situation on the job market and digital is as crazy as the industry market altogether. 
So it has never actually been more important to kind of keep your workforce satisfied. And I'm not saying this technology will, I don't know, miraculously save the world, but it might just make some teams more happy. And we are coming to the to the to the part where we are talking about the third group that we are going to assess uh, uh, that we are actually going to assess the benefits that they have. We're talking about the businesses, the benefits that the businesses would have from PWAs. First of all, short time to market is something that is immensely important. Since PWA is not actually an app, it's just a web link, there are no geographic restrictions regarding reach. So there is actually a, a, a full freedom from app stores uh, and distribution is much easier, much wider. And uh, actually, there is no need to build and, and market separate apps on one store, the other store, go through a typical submit, review, approve, publish process. It just takes a lot of time. It's it and and and, and that can significantly actually shorten uh, the time to market. In some case, it can be literally like a month or two. So it, we are talking about weeks that could be cut down in this time to market uh, period. If you're talking about reducing customer acquisition cost, uh, PWA is, is a standard. If you use it, uh, you can build a site that can ask users to actually add the app. Uh, directly from the mobile browser. So again, since users don't need to download anything, they're less hesitant to try it. There's no need to download updates either. So uh, there is much higher probability uh, uh, of onboarding a user successfully through uh, using this way. Because as I said, all the all the all the uh, uh, researches all the uh, in the past years are saying that users are more and more reluctant on downloading the app actually. And this is actually where you will see a lower customer acquisition cost. Okay, so optimizing the cost effectiveness is also very important because stores built with PWA uh, can save up to 75% uh, uh, of, of the cost of the build of a native app. Uh, here we are talking about both development and maintenance costs. So this is not just development. With PWA, uh, you don't have to make a separate native app. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically enough to adjust your storefront and your pretty much good to go. Going further, uh, reducing bounce rate, this is this is a, an important one. Uh, there was a study, there was a Google study back in 2019, I think, uh, that found that around 50% of mobile site visits are abandoned if, the, if a page takes longer than, than three seconds to load. Uh, that's actually a massive loss over just the three seconds. So uh, this study also showed that uh, if the, at the average lower time or uh, load time, over 3D, 3G connections is almost uh, 20 seconds. So just to add to that topic, PWAs are mobile first oriented and extremely lightweight. So on average, PWAs can actually use, uh, can actually uh, uh, load in, let's say up to four times uh, faster fashion. High engagement and conversion. <laughs> PWAs are actually capable of delivering an immersive experience. Uh, this is uh, in part due to the ability to offer full screen capability. Uh, so no address, uh, no address browsers, uh, bars, and so on. Uh, and also they are easily accessible when it comes, they're, they're, they will easily access uh, web push features. So all of these combined uh, serve as a great engagement and conversion tool. But mm, Actually, that's not the only thing that influences engagement as offline capability influences it as well. Just thinking about that in a situation where a mobile app would actually drop out because of a, of, of a loss of connection, user actually uh, would stay in the PWA and simply continues using it. So they will stay engaged. Okay, increasing marketing return of investment. This is something immensely important for uh, marketing teams. As we already said, PWAs work offline, while with any other web store, not just mobile app, a uh, user simply drops out. So PWAs are really offering an amazing level of engagement, but also re-engagement. By engagement, I'll just mention an abandoned cart. A user in PWA browses catalog, so adds a product and forgets about it, but at the specific time, a notification comes in and reminds him, and he finalizes a purchase, and perfect, that's pretty much it. So also the channel that we are offering there for marketeers, it's a less noisy channel. It's a, it has, I think, almost a 10% click-through rate, reduces, reduces customer drop-off, and I believe it can be triggered by almost any event. Going further, we are talking about winning Google SEO rankings. So it's super clear that Google SEO ranking is immensely important for any website, and especially for an e-commerce site. So search engines actually view PWAs and websites because that's basically what they are. 
uh, they are that, that actually means that they are easily indexed. So for comparison, native apps are not exactly searchable. I mean, you can find an app, but you cannot really find something within the app. So that actually means if you would be searching for, for let's say, red dress, you will not find a product inside a mobile app, rather the ones that are listed on the shop on, 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 on that, that, that same business's uh, e-com site. So not exactly within the app. On the other hand, if you have a PWA, uh, these products will be easily searchable through Google because, again, it can be easily indexed. Running store without any breaks. Uh, this is, in some sense, uh, kind of a continuation of that speed topic that I briefly brushed over. Uh, with smaller sites and faster loading times, uh, PWAs actually re reduces uh, server load, so server hit. Uh, therefore, your store, our store, won't crash or slow down during periods of intense traffic, so during the, the, the peak shopping season. So you can rest assured, your client can rest assured that the poor, poor, that this problem will not decrease uh, the sales anymore during the, the, the period where we actually are trying to scoop up as much as possible of the of the revenue that is actually waiting for us. So uh, overall, to kind of uh, top it up, uh, uh, I believe we can agree that there are quite a few reasons why businesses uh, would need to consider progressive web apps. But let's be completely honest, not all of the advantages lined up above will work for everybody. Because it, 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 it really depends also on, on the company. It depends on the products that they are selling. It depends on the business model, on the channels they are using. It also depends heavily on the audience that they are having. So it really comes down to what specific model you have, what specific model your clients has. So shoppers are moving to mobile in general sense, and retailers need to be able to convert that traffic into revenue. I mean, users shifting to mobiles are no reason for retailers to experience any losses. On the contrary, I'm quite confident it's an opportunity. So combining the features of, of more, uh, uh, that, that are offered by most modern browsers with the benefits of mobile apps, I believe it can give any business uh, incremental revenue boost. So with this, I will finish my part and I believe we can go to Q&A. Thank you guys for your presentations. Right now I'm switching to the Q&A mode and you can ask your question using the chat on the right side and don't forget to add a question mark at the end of the sentence and our experts are, are waiting for your questions. Okay. I muted you, Aga, and I think that was the cause. Um, uh, the first one is easy. Should be there be so sound? Yes, it should be so sound. Uh, <laughs> uh, we will send the slides to uh, Aga Ag Agata. Yeah, we already ex uh, answered there that we will send the um, recording, so, and uh, the slides will be there. So that will be it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. You will receive the uh, recording with the summary email by the end of this week, and uh, mm -hmm. all slides will be visible on the recording. So no yeah. worries. Uh, I see that uh, this uh, this question that is here is uh, probably to you, Arthur. Yeah. So uh, feedback and improvement phases. Yes, this happens uh, throughout the uh, the developing and and polishing phase. Uh, this is basically quite rapid iterations. So, um, you know, um, within within one week, we conduct like you know a lot of a lot of in, a lot of testings, which are improved. So, when one person, for example, is making the test, the other one is uh, polishing the uh, the prototype, and another one comes for the ready and improved one. So, yeah, it, it is happening at the at the development phase. Great, thank you. And the next question appeared during uh, Alex's presentation. I saw that Sebastian Stopanski, one of our uh, developers at Divante, uh, explained it uh, on the chat, but maybe you can add something more, Alex? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so it's just uh, asking this question is why they are doing this. It's just they are the biggest and they are doing this. So definitely there's like a bunch of people who have played and uh, with great vision. They are doing it for purpose. I think 
in a, such a huge organization when you have hundreds of people who are focused on just uh, maintenance of elements, definitely uh, reduce in, uh, in, in operations in this area uh, and reduce, even tiny, uh, uh, percentage of percentage uh, will, will bring a huge value to them. So that's for sure one aspect. The second aspect, of course, is time to market. When you are building such a huge, um, a huge platform, that will be almost at some point impossible. And the growth of the technical debt will be so rapidly growing that you would need to replace a system over and over every few years. So uh, definitely, if I would uh, guess, the reducement in area of maintenance would be one of them. The second, probably time to market in terms of implementation, new things and, and new functionalities, but probably uh, uh, for them, it was considered all the elements I already mentioned and probably uh, a few others. Okay, thank you, Alex. Another question? To Z. For Z, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that this is exactly one of the things that I have mentioned, and you are, you are absolutely right. You do not go. You do not need to go through the app store to actually have a PWA uh, on your phone. Uh, so yeah, that I think I've mentioned it. But at the same time, uh, the, if you worry about uh, distribution, you can also provide a PWA and a specific wrapper, which would actually enable for it to also be in, in the App Store. So if you were going to have that, that's that that's possible as well. But yes, one of the main advantages is that you do not have to go through the through the hassle of the process. Think what I need, think of an app I might need, find it in the store, download it, and like you don't have to go through all that. Yep, you're right, Eva. Thank you, Z. Uh, yeah, this is this is a, this is a very uh, thank you, Massimiliano, for the question. This is a very tricky question. Obviously, this is this is a question that is hard to answer without getting any kind of a details in regards to what we might be talking about. So it's it's really hard hard to answer. Uh, maybe maybe I can shed some light. Uh, if you would go with maybe solution that would be a little bit closer to the box solution, something that 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 VSF might kind of provide. Uh, the costs might be a little bit lower than compared to something that would go uh, closer and be aligned with uh, uh, custom PWA. So definitely something that is boxed, something that, for instance, is offered already with a new storefront, is offered already with a theme that they offer. Uh, if you are talking about, let's say, uh, if you're a retailer, if you have like a, 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 a typical uh, a fashion business or something like that, in that sense, you are pretty good to go, if I may say, uh, with the VSF uh, uh, stock option that you might have, that, that we have, and actually do a little bit of customizations there. That would definitely help uh, keep your costs uh, 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 lower. But if you have like a big business, if you, if you need a lot of customizations, if you are looking for a lot of features that are actually not available right now through through the out of the box uh, uh, package, uh, yeah, that, that will definitely ramp up some costs. But Honestly speaking, that would ramp up some cost with any platform, regardless of it being offered in a headless uh, uh, manner. Yeah, I would just add uh, some very important aspect for, for headless uh, commerce and head headless ecosystem general architecture. Um, the number of licenses in a headless e-commerce is, of course, way bigger than having monolithic. Because every single piece you, you would like to have definitely you have to take from the market. Probably uh, time to market, the number of out-of-the-box features is way higher, but at the end of the day, there is no uh, more such a open source policy here. Probably in some cases, but in general, uh, more of the solutions, most of the solutions are uh, available under the license. It's not like with Magento anymore or any other solutions that you could use open source solution, probably you could achieve a lot. You have some limitations, but not so many. So this cost, of course, um, has to uh, take into consideration development. Uh, but on the other hand, significant cost is related to additional uh, licensing, and it's worth to take it. Um, this is the one cost, but uh, another story is 
cost of maintenance. That is having microservices and predictable uh, stack is 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 totally different than in case of monolithic, especially after a few years of usage. Uh, again, I, I would stress together with Zelimir that it's hard to assess uh, what does it mean average, what what does it mean in general. But if you would like to assess very specific case, uh, contact us. Uh, we will try to help you. Thank you guys for explanation. And I think that we have a quite similar question here. Yeah, this is pretty much uh, uh, what Alex also answered. So definitely uh, any part that is going to be uh, uh, specifically customized to fit the, 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 the specific business needs uh, is going to have to be maintained thoroughly. You got to have like a team that's going to have a good know-how and good experience in, in, uh, in, in managing such things. So yeah, definitely that that is... a. Uh, uh, the, the, the part of the story that goes together with development and does then definitely shouldn't be diminished because the 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 the, the actually the, the the ease of integration um it, it's never going to be easy to integrate it but altogether it definitely is possible it is doable but you need to know what you're doing so we have been in a lot of situations where we actually inherited the project that somebody else is and somebody else started doing and it turned out to be like a not a good start and it needed to be done from scratch because again, uh, doing everything in, in, in a headless fashion, uh, there needs to be quite a capable team and quite some experience on the other side. Mm, uh, yes, but we have to remember that if any solution is branding there, might be branding not, but there is a lot of companies that has another focus on just marketing. But if you have truly headless solution, and this is focused on, for example, like Mach Alliance operation and is tightly connected with the other composable elements. They are always looking to make integrations as easy as it possible. So uh, if you are asking what is easier to integrate, of course, composable, because composable in, in most of cases means easy to integrate because it's predicted to be integrated. Uh, totally in, in total opposition than, than solutions that used to be one or all in one. Of course, in some cases should be integrated, but not so many. And the general idea is to not integrate and to use as much as possible their own uh, components. That's the difference. So if you experience uh, a lot of problems with integrations in the past, but you've been working on monolithical elements, more the problem than the integration itself. Arthur and the question when it to comes you. yeah uh, thanks Bartek um, of course there is uh, there are a lot of cases on our website uh, but I think the best way would be to reach me on LinkedIn and talk about the specific project because there are a lot of POCs which are you know not released so uh, uh, if you could just let me know um, which area of, of improvement you would like to, to hear uh, I would be happy to talk with you further Arthur maybe we can use our show your projects what do you think yeah i think if, if we have enough enough time after ending all of the questions which we have maybe then but i'm being time conscious and we have just 15 minutes to the end so, so let's see if we will have additional time uh, if yes then we will finish with the slides about uh, projects at innovation lab and next question to you alex Alex, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm just looking at this question. Just, just uh, I'm not sure if I understand it uh, correctly. Uh, uh, yes, of course, it's not so. Let's say uh, perfect uh, at the first glance, as, as as you can imagine. Of course, there are some uh, elements related to uh, user interface. You have a lot of elements to manage, of course. But on the other hand, you have a lot of user interfaces that are more likable, uh, that are focused on UX, are newer. So uh, definitely, uh, you have uh, more elements to manage. But at the end of the day, they are easier. Uh, of course, maintenance costs 
uh, I think related mainly to, to licensing, because of course, uh, if you will take a look at the strict numbers, that could be scary. scary. But on the other hand, capabilities, if you have grown business, middle class or enterprise, uh, if you will uh, take a look how many be benefits it brings, that's for sure. Another cost uh, and another challenge is that you cannot have like random people who will just take a look at the system, spend a while, and after three months will managing everything. Of course, it's not uh, working uh, like this anymore because you will spend a lot of time on, on system. You will spend a lot of time on, on uh, elements that could bring you money. But at the end of the day, there has to be people who, who, who knows how to treat this whole uh, complexity. That's for sure. Uh, this is a solution for rather major, major, uh, major businesses and people who knows how to run it. But on the other hand, uh, we have to remember that uh, composable commerce is rather for bigger players. For smaller play players, there is a more and more uh, interesting solutions. Um, if you will take a look at the, 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 the fastest growing uh, solution for the small and middle market, uh, this is Shopify and Shopify Plus with some limited but still uh, options for, for customizations. Um, that's for sure. But uh, we have to remember about it that it could generate way more, uh, way more uh, revenue and way more, more opportunities. But of course, if you compare it easily with monolithic elements, uh, there, there might be some, some differences. Thank you, Alex. And another question. See, so probably it's to you. Mm -hmm. But of course, everyone can uh, answer. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> uh, I think uh, it's it can easily just uh, measure it in a way. Let's say uh, if you have um, a technical depth, you have to check uh, way more elements than at the beginning. Of course, over the year and year, you have more conflicts and uh, any and and implementation and releases. Are just simply taking more and more time. It's it's quite hard to to measure it uh, in practice, and it's 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 quite hard to 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 give you as very specific uh, numbers. But uh, it's easily uh, noticeable that if you will, if you have one year or two year old uh, uh, solution or platform, uh, you are implementing new elements uh, way faster than when you have uh, some legacy system, and this is. Uh, well-known uh, 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 truth. In terms of the examples, um, I think you are changing so many things after after migration, the whole process. Uh, that's uh, that's that's it hard to compare. Probably it would be way easier uh, to compare it during the process of uh, decomposition of of the whole solution because sometimes we are just making the whole migration of the whole system but sometimes we just taking out from the monolithic monolithic uh, architecture few elements like search or uh, for example OMS related elements and then probably that would be way easier to to measure some improvements on an older system uh, in comparison with the uh, new elements uh, we have very interesting case in progress when we are focused uh, strictly on that uh, decomposition of the monolithic and probably we'll have uh, uh, more very like strict data to tell you more about it. Anyone else would like to add something to this topic? Okay, if not, I will switch to another question. Hmm. Okay, so when it Okay, uh, well, I mean, when it comes to recommendation of any any uh, uh, solution out there, it actually needs to be in line with with what client needs. So, if you are talking about recommendations, we can recommend something that we have previously used, something with uh, where we have experience, and like uh, that's that's the only kind of recommendation that we would actually offer. Uh, overview would actually we don't have like overview per se. But if you are talking about the loyalty programs, definitely we can mention Open Loyalty, which is a 
uh, one of the products that is being uh, cultivated, uh, incubated in our in our company, and that actually is a, a full fledged um, API driven headless solution that is going really strong. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it has been brought to life in in uh, uh, innovation lab. Uh, uh, so it's, when it comes to loyalty, this is something that we would definitely definitely uh, uh, suggest. When it comes to uh, uh, books that we might be able to recommend for composable commerce and PWA, uh, not a problem, Christian. If you can uh, leave your uh, uh, email in, 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 the, in, in the chat, uh, we can actually send you a link to, to the, 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 our own resources because we have written quite a bit about composables, about PWAs and so on. So I think those might be a good starting point uh, because at the same time, whatever is not going to be kind of clear for you, you can ask directly the people that actually created it, us. Thank you, Z. I think that we will link a few of the sources in our summary after the webinar, like the eBooks and the articles on our blog, so you can check it later. And the last question. Yeah, so Tomislav, um, it is, uh, the other way around, uh, because uh, some of the people did uh, projects on the production on the client side, and 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 we took them to um, to be dedicated for the innovation lab. Because uh, right now we're focusing fully on that and on educating um, and other teams how to do the, um, the the continuous discovery. So this is like you know um, people who did projects but wanted to to put put more focus on the product and educate further. So that's that's how it works now. Okay, thank you. It was the last question. So I think that we can finish our today's meeting. Thank you all for taking part in this first webinar. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. So thank you Thanks again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. have a great rest of the day. Ciao. Bye. 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 Bye.